problem with the Supreme Court decision here, is that the last two decisions dealing with the, the, uh, the mandates, tried in those decisions to skirt as much as possible the fundamental questions underlying all of this, and eventually going back to the Nuremberg Code. Can you impose this on someone? This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments, Kilo Valcambi Silver Bars, for only two seventy five over spot, ten ounce Nadir Silver Bars, for only two ninety five over spot. Call us at one eight 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 one Liberty. That's one eight 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 one five four two three seven. We're gonna. This is gonna be a challenge because each of these could evoke. Uh, Footnoted references to half a dozen or more things that you just told us. In fact, you might want to make passing mention, but uh, uh, at least we'll see how quickly how how quickly we can uh, an- come up with a short answer to each of these. Uh, Matlas X says, "Question: We have seen the U.S. Uh, President of the U.S. over the last few years abuse executive orders in order to bypass the legislative branch, but we are now seeing some red state governors using executive orders to counter some of these COVID mandates, which again bypasses the legislature. What?" was the original role of executive orders and do we need to re-examine their use on both sides of the political spectrum? Well, the executive orders originated in the concept that the executive, the president or the governor, had to control his own uh, staff, if you will. All right. So the president could direct that there were going to be, let's say, you know, staff meetings, cabinet meetings or whatever, on a certain basis, on a certain time period, etc. So that's one level. It's essentially internal housekeeping of the executive branch, which would have no effect outside of the executive branch. It would just be how members of that particular branch of government had to interact among themselves or interact with the president. Then the next level of executive orders is Congress could pass a statute, or the state legislature could pass a statute, saying that under certain circumstances... The executive would have the certain kinds of authority, and let's assume that this is constitutional, something the executive could do. And the executive would have to make a, a finding of fact that the circumstances were such, and then write an executive order or proclamation, because that's another way of doing it, implementing that statutory authority under the finding that the circumstances had arisen under which that authority should be implemented. And you would say, well, that's legitimate. If all, of these constitu- if all these steps in the process were constitutional, Congress has the power to do this. Congress has the power to give the executive branch the, the authority to execute that particular law under certain circumstances. Then the executive order would simply be a fulfillment of that scheme that Congress had created so as to put that particular statute into, into effect. What's happened now in many instances is the executive orders are what I would call fantastic in the sense that they don't really tie themselves to specific language in a statute. They're kind of in, in, invented to expand the authority of the executive branch president or the, or the governor. And then, you, then what you have to do is you have to look into it because in many instances they will say in an executive order, pursuant to certain authority has been granted to the president, granted to the governor. I'm doing the following. And that's where you get into the question of uh, uh, legal analysis. Well, is this pursuant to? Does the statute actually give you this authority? Have you gone beyond the statute? Are the circumstances not uh, appropriate here because of the way the statute has, 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 has set up the conditions, etc.? Uh, and a lot of people seem to think, and this gets back to the point I made earlier, that under some kind of an emergency situation, when the executive branch finds it as an emergency that's occurred, then executive orders can simply flow from that set of perceived conditions. And that's entirely false. Yeah, I think you pointed out that the Constitution does not even use the word emergency. And even if there is what everyone would agree or should agree is an emergency, then you'd still use the Constitution and the constitutional processes to deal with it. Well, you still have to find the authority. That is, we could all agree that some set of circumstances is an emergency. It's never happened before. It's a very dangerous situation, etc. Then we look around and say, well, what are you going to do about it? And say, well, number one, there's no authority for the military to step in. This isn't something that the Joint 
staff can decide what to do. No authority there. There's no authority for the judiciary to step in directly and give orders. Maybe there's no authority for any agency to do it. Maybe there's no authority for anyone to do it. All right? Congress hasn't passed a statute, or, or the Constitution specifically provides against it. Oh, we have an emergency of crime in the inner cities. Therefore, we have to just have, you know, uh, 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 what shall I call it, arrest without due process. Okay? And, and uh, we beat confessions out of people. That's the only way to stop gang violence. It's an emergency in inner city of Chicago. Well, the Constitution doesn't allow that. There may be an emergency of gang violence in inner city of Chicago, but you can't address it by, by calling in supposed members of gangs and beating confessions out of them. Now, we all agree it's an emergency, but this is not the way to approach it. So it sounds like that's a resounding yes, that that can be abused on both uh, sides of the aisle, if that's the way to say it. And it uh, sounds like one way to uh, deal with that is for people to realize that. And, and so and in some uh, and some states, for example, uh, uh, citizens groups have organized to try to redress or repeal or block uh, certain extraordinary powers that were that were assumed by governors or mayors or whatever along the way. Um, We've uh, got another question here from. Now, this is one we did not address in our recent discussion here. You've, you've touched, you and I have touched on it in the past very, very briefly. I think you've got almost a one word or two word answer. But um, given what you described about the who he who pays the piper calls the tune that that uh, Congress is trying to tie almost unlimited uh, control or influence over people based on the fact that they do or don't receive Medicare, Medicaid, and other types of funding. Uh, could that be reversed in the sense that if, if they don't really have any money other than that which they're, we're giving them as in uh, income tax, for example, does the populace uh, have the right to withhold that? Uh, Jason asks, do you believe we should not be paying income tax? Well, you, you know, you, you have a couple of problems. There. The, the first question in my mind is, what's the legitimacy of income tax constitutionally? And that raises all sorts of complicated questions, going back to the 16th Amendment interpretation, of the 16th Amendment, even before. Right? Uh, and there you get into the problem of that's always involved in the perception that some activity by a public official is constitutionally invalid. What do you do in response to that when they're attempting to impose that requirement on you? And the short answer, I mean, the income tax situation, the short answer in my mind has always been, if you consider it to be invalid, and there are a number of grounds on which some part of the income tax code could be invalid, besides constitutional grounds, then the clearest way to do it is to, as they say, pay the tax under protest, file for a refund, go for a refund in the, in the court, and have it addressed by the court system. And I think if they had enough of those cases coming up, we would see some kind of, how shall I put it, reform maybe isn't the word, but amelioration of the situation. But anybody who simply says, I'm going to, in any area, I'm going to defy an official's imposition on me of some particular quote-unquote law, statute, let's call it, on the basis that that imposition is either unlawful under the statute or unconstitutional. The statute's unconstitutional. Then he has to take essentially the consequences, the legal consequences of it. You're stuck with that. I don't know any way around it. You know, within the system, the system has to be challenged essentially on its own terms. Or well, the official has to be challenged on the terms on which he's supposedly operating, which is he has taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States or the state of the state or both typically or both if he's a state official. And if he violates that oath, then he becomes subject or his actions become subject to judicial challenge. And as you just said a moment ago, Dunnigan, I mean, there are people that are going proactively to seek to have claimed authority on behalf of governors or mayors or whatever uh, rescinded or declared invalid, and of course rescinded by the legislature, go to the legislature and ask the legislature to pass a statute preventing this, or go to the courts and ask the courts to declare 
that that exercise of authority is invalid under the Constitution or perhaps under, under some other statute. And that's the mechanism that we have. Now, again, we come into this problem. If, if that system doesn't work, if that system consistently fails and drives our, our society in further and further into the assertion of unconstitutional authority by rogue public officials, then what happens? Well, at some stage way down the road, and I'm not one to predict exactly when that happens, you run into a declaration of independence situation. Got, that's what the colonists said. We've tried everything we could do. You read the declaration. We tried everything we could do. We went to the king. We petitioned the king. We went to parliament. We even went to our British brethren, as they say, the average Englishman, and said, look, wait a minute. You're imposing things on us which are beyond the authority of parliament. Please correct that. And as they say, all of these petitions were met with further grievances. And then what happened? Well, it's at some stage. At some stage down the road, if the system becomes so uh, arthritic, if you will, the joints no longer function, then you run into a declaration of independence set of circumstances. I don't think I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're there now. I think we're, you know, because there are so many elements here that are obviously antagonistic towards the country moving further and further in that unconstitutional direction. I would say it's, you know, if the Biden regime is only 33 percent approved by the country, well, what does that tell you? Fifty something percent of the country, more than half of the country, is against what they're doing. Well, in a sense, that's a good sign because a lot of what they're doing, the Democratic Party is doing, is clearly beyond the Constitution. So we're still we're still in that we're still in that pre uh, declaration situation. We're still exhausting all those uh, all those uh, avenues. Malice X asks, is it time for us to come to terms with the idea that the republic is lost? The Constitution has been diluted too far beyond repair and maybe we need to start over. No, because I don't know how you I, I, personally. I don't know exactly how you start over. All right. In the Declaration of Independence situation, they started over they, in the truest sense. They segregated, separated themselves from, from Great Britain and set up their own constitutional structure, first in each one of the independent states, then through the Articles of Confederation, then through the actual Constitution, Bill of Rights, and everything that's followed from that. Okay. And then obviously that took a, a long period of time, and it was a consequence of a highly destructive war of independence. Right? I mean, the British didn't accede to that. They tried to suppress it. So are we at that point? I would say no, because we still have the institutional structure. Now, the problem is that certain, certain of those institutions are, I wouldn't call them moribund, but they're getting to that point. I mean, just look at the Supreme Court decision here, the last two decisions dealing with the, the, uh, the mandates. Okay? He tried in those decisions to skirt as much as possible the fundamental questions underlying all of this, and eventually going back to the Nuremberg Code. Right. Can you impose this on someone? Whether it's through OSHA, whether it's through uh, re regulations tied to funding, whether it's through a direct congressional statute, or perhaps some state statute, or whatever. Can you do that? Well, this is kind of typical of the court system. They try as much as possible to decide a case on as narrow a basis as they can so they don't tie themselves down too much. Now, so we look at that and say, okay, that's, that's the way the system has worked. And unfortunately, it's, dri it's driving us in the wrong direction because at some point they're going to have to face this much bigger problem. He said, now. So I say to the person who asked this question, I think he's looking at that and saying, oh, yeah, if, if, if you kind of prognosticate here the way this is going, the way these institutions are tending, yeah, we're at the end of the tether. They're not going to solve our problems. The court says we're not going to solve our problems. The legislature's not going to. And all I can say is I don't, I don't know that that's true. Right? I don't know we reach the, the position where you can say it's fundamentally untrue because we see in some of the states, I think Florida might be an example, we're seeing a kind of the application of the Tenth Amendment concept that the states have certain powers of their own, which are not subject to control from Congress. And they can follow a different direction. So there's an avenue that's opening up. And let's see what happens there. I think this whole, this, I think this whole vaccine mandate is going to be one of the major areas that tell us what the final result is going to be. You mentioned earlier in our, in our previous talk about 
the importance of getting organized in broader movements because splinter groups who uh, petition for redress of wrongs are more easily ignored. Uh, Jim Jones asks, how do we organize without becoming a target? Well, you don't. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the more you, it, it, yeah, the more you intend to expand your organization, the more likely you're going to become visible as to what you're doing. So the answer is, well, no. What you want to be careful of doing is not organizing in an improper, illegal manner or organizing for an obvious illegal purpose. All right? So if, you, if you're organizing, and this is something I've come talked to before, organization for revitalization of the militia. Now, you've got a lot of people in this country on the quote-unquote left, on the, author, on the truly authoritarian side, who are terrified of the average person actually exercising authority within his, within his own government. That's why they don't like the militia concept, because if you understand what the militia is constitutionally, you understand that it's the ultimate institution of popular sovereignty. So if you want to, as I'd like to say, revitalize the militia, you don't go about doing that by forming private groups that call themselves militia. You might form private study groups that would prepare legislation and put that in petitions to people in the executive branch, people in the legislative branch of government, so that the statutory law of the various states would be amended in order to give you the results you want. Oh, and then, of course, you'll be criticized. I mean, the media will, left-wing media will criticize you, and you know, various political figures will criticize you, and celebrities, goofy celebrities will criticize you, and so forth and so on. Well, that's, that's simply because you're going against the grain, their grain. But that's what I, I, would, I would never worry about being, quote-unquote, targeted, because there's no, there's no way in the long run that you can petition for redress of grievances without coming into the open. So they say, this is what we want you to do. And as the First Amendment says, you have a right to assemble for that purpose. Well, what is that assembly? Form a, form a group. Sit down and talk about it. Work out what the proposed legislation should say. Talk to some members of the legislature who will be willing to support that legislation. Introduce it. Maybe form a, form a, a, a political action type group that promotes that legislation in your you know, your particular locality so that what there'll be public pressure grassroots support grassroots pressure on the legislators to pass that particular piece of legislation i mean what else that that's the that's our system and i'll yeah right now i'll say of course you're going to be targeted if you want to pass legislation to, to uh tax code remove the, the quote unquote income tax you're going to be a target of somebody, some, essentially some powerful political interests that want to maintain that. You want to revitalize the militia, same thing. You want to get rid of public sector collective bargaining. You're going to have public sector unions and everyone who's on their side against you. I mean, if you're worried about being targeted, you're never going to do anything. You're going to, live, you know, you're going to be in a permanent lockdown living in a, a trailer somewhere in upstate uh, North Dakota. And uh, I think that there was also concern, we can talk about it maybe in a future talk, about different forms of targeting, not just being criticized, but uh, being infiltrated, being, uh, you know, undermined, all that sort of thing, and, and, and perhaps strategies that people should use. To... Oh, well, that's exactly, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, that you have, if, if the organization that you're trying to form, the issue that you're trying to promote is of sufficient concern to the powers that be, to the, you know, whoever, the deep state, whatever you want to call these people, then that will be one of their tactics, right? To infiltrate the group, try to create dissension within the group, conflict within the group to make you in, entirely ineffective, or try to promote what would be illegal activity, right? So that some level of government now can come, on, come down on you legitimately by saying, well, you're doing these things that are you know, Ill illegal, uh, or to get your group to take positions that are, you know, in a sense, in some other way, antithetical to the public interest. 
right? So, you know, they infiltrate the, the group in such a way as to get uh, you know, leaders to make racist comments or whatever, you know, this type of thing. And then you can attack the whole group. Say, well, look at the races, the guys over here and what they're saying. And this, this uh, results in, uh, you know, public losing any confidence in what you're doing. So there are a number of different ways. And, and that just brings you back to you've got to keep an eye on the wall. What is it you're trying to do? How are you trying to do this through legitimate means? And everything else becomes extraneous and irrelevant. You don't get involved in it. And you find anyone in the organization that's attempting to lead in that direction, and you say, well, sorry, you can't re- remain you know, in the organization. Well, we're going to have to regroup another time. In fact, I think we're going to have to have a whole new session on these next two topics because it gets back into sound money. Jason's work asks, how many states do you know of that are accepting or looking at accepting silver and gold as payment? Uh, another one, D- D- Diana McGinnis asks, Dr. Vera, please explain why the Constitution is the roadmap for restoring the monetary system based on gold and silver coin and the constitutional silver dollar. So we're going to have to regroup on that next time. Dr. Vera as always, on behalf of our viewers, thank you once again for joining us here again on Liberty and Finance. And if you could just remind people where they can find your work. You can find most of my published work on uh, Amazon. Look me up. And I have a lot in book form uh, or CD form. And I have a rather extensive uh, archive on News with Views. That's one word, newswithviews.com. Look up the writer's link, scroll down, get my archive, and you'll find, oh, I don't know how many articles going all the way back to, I think, 2005. So there's a lot of material there. We'll put a link to newswithviews.com in the description of this video so people can check that out. And uh, just deeply grateful for your presence here with us, uh, Dr. Vera. Thank you so much on behalf of all of our viewers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dunnigan. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs.